Salvete. Welcome on this Ember Saturday. Uh, tonight we will take a look at why it's so important to get the Good Friday prayer for the conversion of the Jews right. We'll say something about the Novus Ordo and why that is being desecrated, then take a long look at history, including hearing from four rabbis, and get right down to where the division in the world is coming from. Um, first, I'm going to go and switch on some more lights in here um, or see if they come on and we'll see some comments, just four or five comments from the last uh, live streams. This is one saying, I found a TLM to attend for Good Friday. I'm traveling to get there because uh, there's not one close to me. This is excellent. Make the effort to travel for the Easter Triduum. It, it's worth it. It will heal the church um, and offer salvation to all those in the world who are awake. This comment requests a, a wider discussion about the differences between the 1962 rite and the pre-55. Definitely that's worth getting into one day. It's a whole lot of work. This Lent I'm just concentrating on Good Friday and that prayer for the Jews. The, the best thing to do, because a lot of this is confusing people, is actually to attend a pre-55 triduum or the traditional triduum. And once you've attended one or two or three, it's much easier to follow all these debates and understand what the changes mean. Because if you just read a list of the changes, it's very hard to follow if you're not familiar with actually being at the right. So I encourage you this Holy Week to try your best to get to the old traditional right. Um, this asks, these are comments from under videos that I didn't get around to answering. What would you say to Catholics who go to the traditional mass but do not recognize the traditional teaching about the Jews and that their friends of theirs also support Israel? I presume that means Zionism. Um, well, this video should help a lot, I think, in showing us the massive, the world of difference between Judaism and Catholicism. But also how they're so far apart, it's like the extremes almost touch. It just take a small act of grace from God for the rabbis to see that lots of their hopes and dreams, which we'll see in the videos tonight, are fulfilled by the Blessed Virgin Mary um, in amazing ways uh, that we can see as Catholics. Uh, and listening to some of them, you just think everything they're doing is talking about Jesus and Mary and they don't realize it yet. Um, explain why some of the Psalms are moved from the breviary. I'll do that in a longer term project this year. It's a massive um, subject. Uh, we don't need that. And here is a group of comments. One is asking about whether or not later we were required to say crucify him on Good Friday. Well, certainly that will never happen at a traditional mass. Also, the 1962, they don't do that. The priest alone or the deacons of the Passion would recite or chant the Passion on Good Friday. And they are delegated to recite liturgically, crucify him. Or it might be that a scholar singing polyphony might have that line. But it's with the Novus Ordo that they try to get the whole uh, group of faithful present to shout that out. And I think through the course of this video, we'll see why this is actually a diabolical deception that has come about like on Good Friday when they had those crowds who had followed Jesus and loved him eventually cry out, crucify him. And now that's happening in the Catholic Church. It's a really sick joke in the most, like, joke of the devil. Most people involved have no idea what they're doing or why. Um, someone, they asked about leaving if that happened, um, but this commentator, the third one, says, don't leave, you're in the right place. If you've got traditional mass, don't leave, you're in the right place. Um, and then at the very bottom, do they genuflect in the Novus Ordo on Good Friday? There's a genuflection in the Passion, of course, but we're talking about the 
great intercessions. And traditionally for all of these, there's been a genuflection, but not for the prayer for the Jews. What they do in the Novus Ordo, I don't know. Whether they genuflect for all of them or none of them, I can't remember. Um, if, if people have an idea, feel free to, to comment. Uh, so we will, I should take a quick look at the comments and then we will see what has been gone wrong in the Novus Ordo church recently. And there's only one church, right? But those places where the Novus Soto is being said, the picture you can see is of the Stephansdom in Vienna, St. Stephen's Cathedral. And very many times, especially every Lent, they do some kind of sacrilege or desecration or insult to Catholics or mockery of Christ. And you can see here the veil that they're using to veil the crucifix and the reredos of the high altar during Lent, they have the Shroud of Turin, but Christ inverted upside down, which certainly will delight all the Satanists who love to do that with Jesus turning upside down. Why is it happening in one of the most glorious cathedrals in the world? They have the relics of St. Stephen there under the altar, um, and, and this is what they do to Christ. They've got this gentleman Wilhelm, someone, artist through it. He's not Catholic. He, he, he might be a Scientologist, I'm not sure. He's not so much to blame as the um, administrators of the cathedral who've allowed this. And why does Cardinal Schoenborn allow this every year? I don't think, he didn't start out this way. It's more like he's acting under some kind of blackmail that he cannot resist these things from happening. I don't have any information on that. But it somehow seems out of character with him, but he can't stop these things happening. So someone else is in control of the archdiocese there. And these two skulls on the left and right displayed in the cathedral, this isn't a memento mori, remember death, that you will die. It's ghoulish, and it's meant to be. Uh, you know, here's a comment I'll try and highlight. Yeah, uh, that's the right thing to do. Get get away from it and, and get to tradition. Um, you know what happened in St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York with all these abominations. Of, of course, um, it's good to pay respects for the dead, but in this abomination, they had men kissing in the sanctuary um, and just disrespect throughout. Other people have listed it better than I. Um, and this in Germany, their chicken song with a clown dancing during the distribution of Holy Communion, which is <laughs> surely the effect of it is to drive the pious out of the church because they just couldn't stand such a thing. Again, the people involved might have very little idea what they're doing, but how did it come to that? Um, somebody saying that it's the lockdowns that brought them to TLM. Yes, God brings good out of evil. And later we'll hear from a rabbi talking about how they continued with their Seder males during the lockdowns and the police tried to stop them. Um, give that to these rabbis. At least they know that, that God is more important than what the globalists and the state try to push on us. We'll hear quite a bit of that, in fact, from the rabbis. A convert from Protestantism, um, he was always bothered where you have to yell out crucify him and god bless you for keeping silent instead if people cannot get to the traditional mass that's what i advise on good friday at Nova Sordo, is when you're expected to shout out crucify him just keep silence make an internal act of reparation perhaps but better not not to be there at all um and one more example perhaps Oh, no. Now we'll move to this history, trying to uncover what's behind all this. Um, hello, Warrington. Love Warrington. I have many, many good reasons to love Warrington. Um, and Bavaria. Um, so back to this list, and I'll try to make pauses between sections so we can look more at the questions 
because again, instead of trying to make a, a waterproof or bulletproof demonstration of all this, it's more illustrations of it. If we consider the war in Gaza right now, if you have a view that just goes back less than one year, if, for example, someone's controlled by the media, they might think that this war is because of Hamas. But if we look back further to a hundred year scale, everything points to Zionism, that this is just part of the direction of Zionism. Um, and it's not uh, to, to get to the heart of it to say Hamas are terrorists, I think it's more accurate to say the state of Israel is an illegal entity, a terrorist organization, in fact. It was born literally from terrorism, and it's maintained itself through lies and manipulation. But even Zionism is not the uh, main program here. It's part of a bigger problem, and we'll see that on the 1,000-year, 2,000-year scale, considering the temple and the efforts to rebuild it. Now in Jerusalem, Muslims are being stopped from going up to the Temple Mount to um, go to the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And uh, that desire to rebuild the temple that's so many centuries old, almost since it was destroyed, there were attempts to rebuild it which couldn't succeed because God prevented it. It's... Um, has links with the Knights Templar and the Freemasons. And we just heard about Cardinal Coco Palmerio uh, and the Archbishop of Milan and a Franciscan theologian who I think is very good, actually, and not the first two. But they had this meeting with Freemasons and they want to establish a permanent dialogue. And one of the Masons was moaning, saying, why is the church excluding us? You know, we, we welcome... Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, anyone, as long as they believe in the great architect. What they mean is this uh, invented false god where they would fit a, a one-world religion. To it's, it's Satan is behind it. This is the um, part of the aim of the Freemasons, who are undoubtedly being used by more satanic and focused people. Because again, most Masons don't have a clue what they're involved with. Um, but the, the church should be talking about a permanent dialogue with Freemasons. It's quite simple. Just say to them, the great architect you talk about is a false god. Rubbish. There is one God, Father, Son, and Spirit, the Blessed Trinity. And the, the second person of the Trinity took on flesh in the incarnation of Lord Jesus Christ and Redeemer. That's it. You have to believe in that to be Catholic, to be welcome in the church. And if you don't, you're excluding yourself. Um, here we have this question about the difference between 355 and 62. If you listen to the beginning of the live stream, I say you, you've got to attend the rites a couple of times to see that. I just advise go to the 355 or watch the last couple of live streams to talk about the difference of one prayer, the Good Friday prayer. Well, one of the differences, right, on the Easter vigil, for the 60 after 1955. In fact, they introduced it in 1951 as an experiment. They said, bring a table into the sanctuary and that beautiful blessings of the Easter waters with all the candle being dipped in and the oil being poured in and all the symbolism and breathing on it. They said, don't do that um, facing the East, liturgical East, but bring a table into the sanctuary, do it there facing the people. And then on Palm Sunday as well, from 55, they said, bring a table into the sanctuary, bless the palms on the table facing the people, whereas it used to be done on the epistle side of the altar. Um, and this bringing a table into the sanctuary and facing the people is the beginning of what we see with the Novus Ordo. And believe me, when you hear later what the rabbis say about the table, one of them saying it's the biggest secret in the universe, that the Hebrew word for table is derived from that which means to send, and it's where God sends his blessings upon the world. So to, to remove our altar for sacrifice and to insert a table, and the Novus Ordo prayers talk about these blessings of creation, of the God of all creation, it's Judaism, basically. And we see that beginning in 1951 and 1955 with the changes to Holy Week, and then in 1969, 1970, with the Novus Ordo going viral, going mainstream. 
Um, this is a very good comment. D don't receive Holy Communion on Good Friday. It should be just the celebrant who receives on Good Friday, the host that he consecrated on Holy Thursday. Because on Good Friday is the actual day of Jesus' Passion, whereas every other day of the year, apart from Holy Saturday, we have a Mass as a memorial to the Passion. On Good Friday, it's much more direct, and we venerate the cross. We bow on our knees and kiss the cross. So instead of receiving Holy Communion, you're kissing the cross to think this is the day where it really happened, of which the Mass is a representation. So even if other people are receiving on Good Friday in your church, that's a shame. Just stay in your pew and uh, take your opportunity when you're venerating the cross to adore our Lord then. Um, so let's lose the Freemasons. And we'll go back further. We, we, we're talking now about the Tower of Babel and the Hebrews exodus from Egypt. You remember Pharaoh's court was full of those magicians um, working black magic. And the Tower of Babel was about one world government. These currents are still at work in the world today. Um, and when the Jews were exiled to Babylon, they picked up a lot of these dark cults. Ezekiel had a vision of idolatry in the temple by the Sanhedrin. I'll see if I can pull that up. Um, it's not working. Oh, yep, yeah, there we go. Uh, is it working? Yep. So here we have Ezekiel 8. And in his vision, he saw every form. This is in the temple of creeping things and of living creatures and the abomination. And all the idols of the house of Israel were painted on the walls round about. And 70 men of the ancients, this is Sanhedrin and uh, Jezonias, the son of Saphan, stood in the midst uh, before the pictures. Each had a censer and a cloud of incense and smoke going up. And the angel says to Ezekiel, Surely thou seest, O son of man, what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every one in private in his chamber. For they say, The Lord seeth not, the Lord has forsaken the earth. This is idolatry and abominations and black magic in the holiest place then, in the temple. But read verse 13. He said, If thou turn thee again, thou shalt see greater abominations which these commit. And I think this includes the what we've seen in the Stephansdom and this, this church in Germany and St. Patrick's, that these abominations, turn again, you'll see worse things, because these are worse because they're happening in Catholic sanctuaries where God is substantially present, which was never the case in the temple in Jerusalem until Jesus actually went and visited it. So... We'll go back there and also right back to the beginning, to the Garden of Eden. See, it's all about a rejection of God. It's the serpent's plan, but the Blessed Virgin Mary crushes his head and we'll see the wonderful ways she fulfills the plans of the rabbi. Um, before we start on the first video, um, yeah, great Saint, Saint Hildegard and Saint Gertrude and Saint Mechthild all awesome saints. Whether the Mass on the Easter Vigil should take place in the morning, I think it's good when it does. There's several reasons why it's good when it does. It doesn't have to. could be early afternoon or whatever. But it's a mistake to think it has to be at sundown. Um, I've spoken about that in a previous video. But when it's in the morning, you're just much more alert for it. Um, <coughs> Here's a link to a petition against that inversion of Jesus Christ in the Cathedral of St. Stephen in Vienna, if you want to sign that petition. It's in a German article, of course, or Austrian. Um, so I hope you can work your way through that if Austrian isn't your first language. Um, okay, now we'll go to the first video, and I, hopefully I can get the sound right and I can give a commentary without... Well, a Q survey not a number of years ago asked what's most essential to Judaism, what's essential to Judaism to you. And the thing that came in first place was remembering the Holocaust. Now, of course, remember the Holocaust. Of course, there are lessons of the Holocaust. But Zionists made it front and center of Jewish identity. It became part of their identity. This is uh, Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro. Uh, he's against Zionism, and he's worth listening to. Okay, now, now, like Norman that, Finkelstein's book, The Holocaust Industry. Yes, oh, I yeah. call it in my book, The Church of the Holocaust God. 
so that the Holocaust has been turned into an industry by some and to others into a, a this rabbi is saying it's a false religion. They're turning it into a religion. And it's it, it became part of their identity. Now a Newsweek reporter named Alsop once told Golda Mayer that he thinks she has a Masada complex because it's they're, they're traumatized, these Zionists. And uh, she said, yes, we have a Masada complex and we have a Holocaust complex and a pogrom complex. The thing is that most people consider their complex as something to get rid of. They go to therapists for that. But to the Zionists, this is literally their identity. And because they don't have the traditional Jewish identity, the one that I identify with, they need to fill that gap with something. They have to fight and die for things and kill for things. And this, this Holocaust identity and this nationality identity, and it's all emotion and it's, it's, it doesn't stay the same. They still haven't defined what a Jew is or uh, it doesn't matter. There's a Holocaust. It doesn't matter what a Jew is. We'll think about all this later. You had a lawyer on and she was talking about law and international law. But what good after we get rid of the Hitlers and the, the Hitler du jour, we'll, we'll, after we're safe, everybody wants to kill us. There was a hit song in Israel once called Kol Olam and Kol Negdenu. The whole world is against us. It was an actual song, a hit song in Israel. Everybody wants to kill us. We got to get rid of First, we got to be safe. Then we'll worry about all these technicalities. Mm -hmm. And it keeps running and running and running like that. And it. Okay. So he's showing that Zionism is very confused and it doesn't speak for Jews or Judaism. It's just an element of them. And so if anyone imagines that Hamas is uh, the cause of this current war in Gaza, it was actually Benjamin Netanyahu who funded Hamas at the beginning to get it off the ground because he wanted to split the Palestinians in the West Bank from those in Gaza politically so that the PLO wouldn't have control of the whole. So he wanted to uh, bring Hamas up as competition for the PLO. And he created it. Um, so we have to look a bit deeper to find out the causes of the current conflict. And as Rabbi Shapiro was saying, when you have a mentality through brainwashing about a false narrative of the Holocaust that everybody hates you, the whole world hates you, that's why a lot of these Zionists are so trigger happy and ready to start World War III. Because they think basically the world is after them, is gonna kill them if they don't get there first or at least dominate the world and subdue us to their plans. And Zionism, though, is changing its character since October 7th with the conflict. A lot of Jews have left Israel. I, I heard somewhere 2 million, but I don't see how it could be that many in such a short time. But these are the less religious Jews who are leaving Israel and don't want to ever go back. And it's going to leave Israel with a population uh, demographically that's more inclined to religion, to Judaism. And we'll see how some of the rabbis who come up soon are opposed to the rebuilding of the temple. Others of them are very, very committed. They think it's the most important thing in the world. And in fact, that it's behind um, this war is for the sake of the rebuilding of the temple. We'll come to that. In any case, here we'll hear from Livy Shaw. He's with uh, a rabbi. This is a scary one. The governments of the world, the government of Israel, the government of America, they're going to turn to absolute heresy, blasphemy. Like the crazy ideas of like two men can be married. You know, they, they, oh, that's normal. And how dare you be against it? We'll arrest you if you're against it. Or, or you know, pushing the atheism under the guise of separation of church and state, but pushing really atheism onto the public. You know, in this secular government in Israel, pretending like they're the legitimate leaders of the Jewish people. Like, the, you know, like Hashem's not our king. Like Torah and mitzvot is not, is not what's guided us for 4,000 years. It's their secular nonsense, you know. And they've shown they couldn't stop the attack on October 7th. It's the final mission of there. And it talks about the conditions before the coming of Mashiach. And there's a very scary thing that's talking about the destruction of the Galil, the destruction of the Galilee, the northern part of Israel. And unfortunately, we can see it. It's so scary. It's so right there with Hezbollah, with Iran pushing Hezbollah, you know, to invade at some point. And that invasion could be coming soon. I mean, but this, this is the scary one. The Hagalil Yechera and the Galilee region, the northern region.
region of Israel is going to be destroyed. And it's right there. We're like on the verge of it. It's so scary. And I, I really hope the Jewish people in Israel, I hope they're careful. I hope they're evacuating from the north. I, I've heard some sometimes on Israeli uh, media, they try to encourage people to go back. It, it's like, I hope I hope the invasion comes if, if it comes soon when people when the Jewish people aren't there. And it could just be the destruction of the houses, not the people. But it's scary to me that after we saw what happened on October the 7th, they're still playing around with Hamas. They're playing around with Hezbollah. They're playing around with Iran. And we see it with America too. It's insane. This is why I say it's the fall of the American empire. These things are all connected. Everything's tied in together. How do you see that connection? So the coming of Mashiach is tied in to the end of Edom, the end of Rome. It's tied into the, there, there has to be an end to Zionism sometimes for, for, a, for a Mashiach, for a Melech. Yeah, you? I mean, that's, that's another condition right here. That's the condition of a Ha'emes Tehe Nadaris. The truth's going to, ah, okay. right? The truth, we're in the time where the truth, the Emes is gone. It's like you get so much conflicting information. The media is very deceptive. The yeah. media is like, the media is not trying to inform in a way. The media is trying to like disinform. Now, here's another thing. In, in, in Rome itself, in ancient Rome, there's a battle in the Vatican. You have some bishops that are fighting the current pope, and they want traditional Catholicism. You know, they want the Catholicism at least based somewhat on the written Torah. And then you have, can't remember the pope's name, <laughs> that joker, like whatever his name is, like they're trying, they're like the New World Order agents inside the Vatican, and they want, you know, men to marry men and the whole, the whole New World Order agenda, you know. So there's a battle raging all around. Thank you to someone who just pointed out that my comments weren't being heard. I, um, yeah, I had the microphone muted, unfortunately. So interesting to hear the live Yeshua say there that there's a battle in the church in the Vatican from those Catholics who want tradition. And then he said, there's this clown. He doesn't know his name. He means Francis or Bergoglio, um, who is more introducing the depravity and the sexual sins that we see happening in St. Patrick's Cathedral and then all through the church and with fiducia supplicants. So there are Orthodox Jews who lament that the Catholic Church is being um, degraded by this worldly spirit. In a way, they depend upon the Catholic Church being strong and upholding tradition, and tradition as a concept of something excellent. The, the comments I made earlier, I won't waste too much time on this, but it was to do with Galilee, where you had that prophecy, although this is a prophecy from the Talmud, it's not a Christian prophecy, of Galilee being destroyed. Um, here you can see just below the middle of the page, and the Galilee shall be destroyed. This is after the meeting place of the sages will become a place of promiscuity. So whether that meant the uh, Jewish elders becoming a place of promiscuity or the conclave of cardinals as we now see but Galilee being destroyed they see that coming with Hezbollah but there are some Kabbalists who are so mental they want to provoke the catastrophe they think if we provoke the destruction of Galilee then that then the Messiah comes that will bring about the end times so they want to actually cause this war with Hezbollah. So if it doesn't make sense what's happening in Israel, just think there are some Satanists behind it who have everything upside down and think by causing the destruction of Galilee, that's one step towards bringing the Messiah. You have some bishops that are fighting the current Pope and they want traditional Catholicism. You know, they want the Catholicism at least based somewhat on the written Torah. And then you have, can't remember the Pope's name, <laughs> that joker, like whatever his name is, like they're trying, they're like the new world order agents inside the Vatican and they want you know, men to marry men and the whole, the whole new world order agenda, you know. So there's a battle raging all around the world. The forces of the Sitra Kedusha, the side of holiness and the Sitra Akra, the, you know, the other side, the dark side, the dark side of the force, you know. I think that's the real 
the real uh, battle. I mean, I mean, like like the, the Gamaras and the Zohars and everything that they're talking like is if is if uh, there's no like background story. There was one army versus another army, one nation versus one nation, and like there's no like nothing going on in the background sabotaging it all, right? And then and then like what we know is is, is yeah, really the it's a it's a big cosmic fight between the forces of good and the forces of evil, right? And uh, and. There are many, many people saying this now from all different religious backgrounds or, or none, that there's a massive fight going on between good and evil. That's what they are reducing it to. Um, you can hear Russell Brand or Tucker Carlson getting at this as well. But we will see it towards the end of this that no, the ultimate reduction is whether you're for Jesus and Mary or against them. It's not just a nebulous good and evil it's it's about real persons they're trying us to trying to get us to degrade ourselves and and to go down in morality and spirituality and um you know like you said israel's in the middle but it's being tugged at from the west that's doing that and it's also being tugged at from the east or the middle east the the, the arabs which are pulling towards religion towards god you know so it's a it's a, it's a big tug of war but they you know they, they have their own perverted uh, ways of seeing things yeah you know, so to, to say what you're saying i, I think to put it in the torah perspective so they believe that, let me just pull up a, a camera here if it works. They're saying that the um, for Israel is caught in the middle between a West that's turning worldly and perverse and debauched and an East or the Arab world, which is attacking them physically and counts itself as holier than them as having the true religion, Islam. Um, as Catholics, we don't, put Israel in the center like that, I think we can see it rather as traditional Catholicism is under these diverse forces which want to tear it down. But their perspective, like many Muslims, is that the West is simply debauched. Our problem as Catholics is that this is entering into the church and in the hierarchy are approving of it. So no wonder they don't see the church as that city on the hill, the light for the world. We saw in the last couple of Parshas that there's a group that came out with us from Egypt and they're called the Arab Rav. And they're just defined as a group of people from many nations that lived in the Egyptian empire. And they're also defined as different degrees of sorcerers, meaning sorcerers at different levels of their knowledge of magic. You know, and, and if you and and this Arab Rav. We'll just take a quick look at this Arab Rav that the rabbi is mentioning. Um, this is in Exodus 12 when the Israelis or the Hebrews exited Egypt, it said a mixed multitude without number went with them. And then it mentions the sheep and the beasts, but it may well be that these were people of various nations. And the rabbi is saying that these are the, into various degrees of black magic, there's the mixed multitude, Erev Rav, um, and sorcery that was in Pharaoh's court. Um, and that these are responsible for the continuing um, it's been described in magic what they do and Satanism. But of course, the Jews took a lot of this on, even while they were in the desert with Moses and rebelling against him and swinging false fire. And it entered the temple worship as well when it was most corrupt. But what's interesting to note is that this, this corruption, this Satanism, goes back before the formation of the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, or the nation of Israel. It's, it's a, a deeper problem. Um, it's basically Satanism, and it can affect people of any nation if they open themselves to it. Try to connect. Oh, we have 10 more minutes. I may have to record another. But they try to connect the forces of Edom and Yishmael together to fight against the Jewish people. And I would say that's the New World Order crowd. They're trying to create this new world order, the Erev Rav, and, and let's name some names. It's probably people like your George Soros, who's on the surface Jewish, but isn't he really probably the son of the Erev Rav? There's nothing Jewish about him, you know? Yeah, I tell, I tell you, I tell you, I got to a point where if you don't keep the Torah and you call yourself Jewish, that's cute. I mean, but like you're either on our team or you're you're not like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, like you, you get, get on board. Like, like at this point, it's like, it's like there's so many atrocities that have been committed yeah. by people who are uh, maybe from the lineage of the Jewish people yeah. that, you know, like, like, like it's, it's just like you, they don't represent. Yeah. Reality. But, but, but atheism is not so there are many different strands of judaism or jews who have no religion um and these men are saying that if you don't keep the torah forget it don't call yourself a jew um i think that they share this at least with catholics who should think if you're not holding on to the faith if you're not holding on to tradition 
um, then why, why do you call yourself Catholic if you don't care about the saving truth that Catholicism gives? World order, this is going way in the other direction where people are literally worshiping the Satan. They're literally Satanists in the world. Besides just atheists, they, they take it a step right. further. Oh, let's just worship the Satan, the, 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 the Malak of evil, the angel who's appointed over evil. Let's worship him. That's great. It's so they, they fully deplore Satanism, um, but they have this veil on their hearts. They can't see that Jesus Christ is the one who uh, defeats all evil and awards to his mother that should crush the serpent's head. Uh, so that's why we're praying on Good Friday for the conversion of the Jews. Listen to these men deploring the wilderness and false religion, but not realizing that they've, they're have they still stuck in that false religion until they come to Christ. So crazy. like you know. Well, they want to go after their urges then. Like, you know, he's leading the charge to go after their urges. So. Yeah. Yeah. That, right. Like Hashem's given us, uh, you know, an outlet. Like you, you can, you marry, a man marries a woman in condition and holiness. You can have children. And, and there's the, that's the place that Hashem's designated for pleasure. But anything outside of that, any physical pleasures outside of that, is it, just giving, giving, you know, giving holiness, giving Kedusha over to the, the forces of the Sitra to the other side, to the, the negative spiritual. He says uh, physical pleasure. He means any sexual activity. The place is within the family, with, just between husband and wife. That's it. Nowhere else for sexual activity. And he's right. And he's saying to give in to the urges, uh, to be depraved or just to sin sexually, you're giving power to the other side, to the dark side. Um, so th there's much in common with traditional Catholics, but they've yet to see the light of Christ. Forces in the world, you know, that's like the heart of the real battle. And we're being inundated, inundated from every every angle by, you know, immodest, you know, pictures, you know, and immodest videos and immodest songs. <laughs> you know, that's putting it lightly, right? They're trying to take us down, trying to take us down. But it's interesting because we got the two battles. We have the Western world, which is really attacking us spiritually trying to diminish the Torah, diminish right. holiness, diminish following the mitzvahs, making it look, you know, unimportant and unattractive in the eyes of the Jewish people. Now we're being physically attacked by the forces of Yishmael, who they're going, oh, we're holier than you. We, right. see your, we see your Nova dance party. We see you dancing in front of a Buddha on your Shabbos, on your Shemini Atzeris, on your Simcha's Torah. We're holier than you. Um, just to pick up on this. No, they do mean the Torah. There are Jews who, who love the Torah, they don't yet see Christ in it. The Talmud is something different. The Talmud is a really mixed bag. It was written over centuries, different commentaries from different rabbis arguing back and forth. Some of it is that black magic, which same commentator put here, but not all of it. Some of it speaks sense, but we reject it because it doesn't have authority. And because it's a mixed bag, Catholics don't accept anything that has error in it. It has to Bonum integrum est. The good is integral. It's all good. If there's anything wrong with it, then throw it out. Like you don't eat a plate of food if part of it is poisoned. You throw it all out if you don't know which part. So we don't want any error in our teaching. The Talmud is a mixed bag with some of the most disgusting, dark and blasphemous stuff in it and other stuff that's interesting and even makes sense. But still, it has no authority. The Tanakh is the law the prophets and the writings that is the old testament minus about seven books which the jews don't recognize but the church knows are holy scripture and and the torah is the first five books of the bible the law of moses the, the pentateuch um so before we get the next video i'll just see if i can answer these y y yes d d there are connections um Sabbatean ideologies are really mad fruitcake, Satanist, nasty, crazy stuff. Um, but that they, they dream big dreams through the worst possible means. I don't think that's the origin, though, of Zionism, as which is a political movement, I think, came quite late. It was more that the Jews long dreamed of returning to Haaretz Israel or the land of Israel and rebuilding the temple, but it never seemed to be a remote possibility. But all the time that they're building up money through usury and they have this great interest in money and manipulating princes, um, then they reach such a high grade of skill in doing that, they realized uh, around 1880, 1890, you know what, this is a real political possibility now. Um, and that's why if you look on the last 100 years, we see what World War II served and World War One, And I, I just watched a documentary on the assassination of JFK and then Bobby Kennedy a few years later. 
And it's unbelievable how this ties in with Israel's nuclear program under Ben Gurion. Um, and then he just resigned before Bobby Kennedy's assassination. You know Jack Ruby, right, who killed Lee Harvey Oswald. His real name is Jakob Rubenstein. Um, that's Jack Ruby. Uh, he, he was the, there to translate into Yiddish or whatever the, the news reports after the assassination of JFK. Um, <coughs> but a fanatical Zionist. So, um, I don't think, no, I think that the Talmud is something different. It's um, the commentary on the Torah um, and perhaps the prophets. So the Torah is the Bible. It's from the first five books of the Bible. The Talmud is a commentary written on it. But some Jews, who some of them will pay more respect to the Torah, and I think they're closer to conversion. Others neglect the Torah, the Bible, and they're all about the Talmud, which is very distracting. There, there is um, one good thing in the Talmud, um, if I can remember. You know when God asked Abraham to bring his son and sacrifice his son, and in, in the scriptures we have, um, call your son your only begotten, your beloved, your son Isaac. And you think, why is God repeating? Why didn't you just say Isaac? Why those four clauses? And in the Talmud, the rabbis or the sages say, this is a condensing of a longer conversation. And Abraham knew what God was going to ask him. And when he said, get your son, um, Abraham's like, what, you mean Ishmael? And God's, no, no, uh, your, your only begotten son, and, or your firstborn. And he's saying, well, Ishmael's my firstborn. By, by Hagar, and God's, no, no, you're firstborn by Sarah, your beloved son. And Abraham's, well, I love both my sons. I love Isaac and Ishmael. And God's, no, no, Isaac, the son of the promise. And everything hangs on that. And I wonder if that's true. It, was there a longer conversation that has been passed down through all tradition and that the rabbis preserved it? We don't need that for salvation. Otherwise, it would be in the scriptures. We don't need it. But it's interesting. And it's, it's in the Talmud. Um, so not everything there is rotten and blasphemous, but m m too much of it is. Um, this is true as well about the red heifers. They, they say when they get a red heifer, then they'll have what they need to, to burn it as a sacrifice, and they take its ashes, and they need its ashes, I think, to reconstitute the high priesthood or the temple or whatever and bring the Messiah. But it's comical how many times in recent years they keep finding the red heifer, um, which is supposed to be a like a one in a 500 year event or something. Um, yeah, this is tragic about the disregard for Palestinian life. I saw some English windbag recently saying about how Hamas are terrorists and since October 7th, it's terrible what they did. And now on that day, the Palestinians killed some 1200 Israelis. Um, and including, I think, 36 babies, infants, which is terrible. Those babies, obviously, don't deserve to be killed, and it's murder to do so. But since then, the Israelis, the IDF, have killed over 10,000 Palestinian children. 10,000. And this windbag on the TV, um, he... It did, that didn't come into his calculation at all. And it, it, part of the English establishment, who are basically way under the influence of the Jews and have been for 500 years since the Reformation. Um, he, it's an Englishman who doesn't count Palestinians' lives as worth anything. That 10,000 of their children can be killed, and that's nothing compared to 36 Jewish babies. We don't want any babies being killed. Um, but how one can be blind to one side and not the other is pure hypocrisy hiding a political agenda. Okay, we'll listen to another rabbi. The instructions God gives to Moshe for the construction of the tabernacle and its vessels, later in history, to become the holy temple, the Beit HaMikdash. So that, as Hashem... This is Rabbi Kaim Richman, um, and when he talks about the Beit HaMikdash, that's the house of God, the, the temple that they want to rebuild in Jerusalem in verse 8, they shall make for me a sanctuary <clears throat> so that I will dwell among them. Well, <clears throat> there's that dwelling down here idea again that we've been learning about. That idea explained by our sages, that's the true purpose of creation, that God desired 
to have an abode in this lowly world, to be welcomed into man's world. But how does that work? So I hope it's obvious that when he says God desired to have an abode in this creation, to live in this creation, you think all the time he's talking about Jesus Christ and doesn't realize it. This is why we need to pray for them. God did come down and have an abode in Nazareth. In, and then in, he lived amongst us. He dwelt amongst us. <clears throat> King Solomon knew that building the temple was not an attempt to confine God's presence in a physical structure. He knew that this is all about establishing a focal point for the manifestation of his presence in the world. And he knew that God expressed a desire for Israel to create a sacred space where the material and spiritual realms would intersect, allowing for a deeper connection between humanity <clears throat> and the divine. So the deepest connection between humanity and divine is in the incarnation where it's not just the material and the spiritual worlds intersecting, it is God and the sacred humanity of Christ united in the person of Jesus. Um, this is what the rabbi doesn't realize he's drawn towards, and he's limiting it to a, either a stone temple, or even he and another will acknowledge it's not so much the temple, but that's a sign for us of God's presence in the world. But Jesus actually came um, and then gave us the Holy Eucharist, which we'll come to. And the deepest truth is that God has been waiting for this since before creation, alluded to by the Talmud's teaching that God thought of the Holy Temple even before bringing the world into being. <clears throat> the okay, that idea of God thinking of the Holy Temple before bringing the world into being, that's in the third of my five books, this one, Crucifixion to Creation. There's a section on the tabernacle, which you can see the tent that Moses built in the desert and the temple are prefigurations of the incarnation and of the traditional mass, which continues the work of our redemption. And indeed, the Immaculate Conception, Our Lady, as that fulfillment of Eden and the temple in whom God came to dwell bodily as he dwelt in her. So there's more about it here. I, I won't go through it, but if you want to pause the live stream, you can see it there. Or we'll get the, the third book, Crucifixion, to creation, which is showing that uh, when the rabbis say God thought about the temple before creation, what they really mean is he thought about the Virgin Mary before creation, because his first thought, as Father Serafino Lanzetta writes, is for the incarnation, for Christ, but that requires his mother Mary. So she's there bound up with that first thought before all creation, and in due course, in the fullness of time, decreed to actually take place. ...of this primordial divine thought informs us that the Holy Temple is part of the secret of man's creation. And indeed, so we are taught. Adam was created from the very spot of the location of the altar in the Holy Temple, the place that re realigns his relationship with God. <clears throat> the Temple is the secret of the Garden of Eden. As the sages teach, the center of the Garden and the location... Just a point, some people bring this up, they say the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem is not really part of the temple. Most Jews know that it's not part of the temple. It's part of the retaining wall of the massive platform upon which the temple was built, where the Dome on the Rock now stands, is where they say the temple was in the Holy of Holies. So the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall, is as close as they can get to it. So it, it's a bit of a, a red herring to say it, it's not part of the temple. The, the Jews know that of the tree of life is the place of the Holy of Holies. Now what all this really means is that the divine service in the Holy Temple is an act of rectification and a way of getting back to the garden. So the program of the Holy Temple is meant to bring about the fixing of what went wrong in the Garden of Eden. God's intention... So the temple is supposed to fix what went wrong in the Garden of Eden, but we know it's Jesus Christ who fixes what went wrong in the Garden of Eden. Jesus said, that my body is the true temple. So whenever the rabbis speak about the temple, just think Jesus Christ, think his body, and you'll see what he's saying makes sense. It's Christ and his body that fixes what went wrong in Eden. And let's pray on Good Friday that he'll see it too. It's for the Holy Temple to be a dwelling place for the Divine Presence, to help restore our original closeness and connection with him by presenting us, all mankind, with the opportunity to return to, return to the pristine state of pre-fall Aden, so that humanity can experience the Divine Presence in a tangible way. 
and giving man, whom God appointed as the maestro over all creation, giving man the opportunity to restore the proper balance between the material and spiritual realms. The tablets within the ark is the Torah dwelling in the temple and shining its light to the whole world. Thus, the ark in Hebrew is called Aron, from the word or, light. The ark is the source of sanctity and light for the whole world, and the light of the first day of creation is hidden within it. So open up your heart in the deepest way. And when the Kohanim consumed the showbread, even though each man received a very small piece, it satiated them as if they had eaten a large meal. So we're saying open your heart in the deepest way. Um, but if you do that, you'll see that this fact that they, or their belief that the showbread in the temple and the tabernacle, when the priests would eat that from Moses on and Solomon on, it would satisfy them for a long time, is obviously fulfilled in the Holy Eucharist, which if you were to only receive once a year during your Easter duties, it would sustain you in grace, provide you didn't fall into mortal sin for the whole year. And, and we know of saints who've lived off the Holy Eucharist. So the, the rabbis took about the showbread sustaining the priests. It's really the Holy Eucharist that does that. And he or another one says that God ordained that it was to be received at a special time and a special place, meaning the, the holy place. Um, but now in the new covenant, everyone who's baptized shares in that priestly character, not in the way of holy orders, ordained priesthood, but the priesthood of Christ. And they receive the bread, which is the bread of life, which is the, truly the body of Christ, at a special time or place. That means in the church in holy mass um, or on your deathbed if the priest comes and brings it to you. Uh, people are asking about the books, it's maybe the moderator. Oh, yeah. the idea that the table also represents the concept of gratitude and appreciation for the blessings we receive. By recognizing and acknowledging the source of our sustenance, we bring about a tikkun for Adam's lack of gratitude in the Garden of Eden. The 12 loaves of bread serve as a reminder of God's constant presence and care, and they symbolize the flow of divine sustenance and abundance to all aspects of creation. This is question about why if the temple is destroyed, could they not build another temporary one elsewhere? Because at the time of the Exodus, God said, I want you to build me a sanctuary and I'll show you when you come into the land, the place to do it, the place that I have chosen. And as this rabbi said, in fact, before, they believe that the Holy of Holies is on the very spot where the tree of life stood. So in Crucifixion to Creation, this third book, it, it shows the links between the foundation stone, which is supposedly under the Dome of the Rock, the first part of creation, they say, we don't need to believe that, but truly where the tree of life was, where Adam was created, where he first woke up and after his sleep, where he woke up and saw Eve, all that's pointing to Jesus dying and then waking up in the resurrection and seeing his bride, the church. And this happened in the same place where Abraham offered Isaac and where Jacob um, had his dream of the ladder reaching up to heaven, which is a figure of the cross, and where later the, the temple was built. There's only one place in the world that they can build the temple if it's to be in continuity with God's command. But we understand that since the time of Christ, it's been universalized. Wherever the altar is, that's where J the rock that Jacob laid his head on to anoint and then dream of the ladder reaching opening heaven. Um, wherever there's Holy Mass, here's the death and resurrection of, of Christ. So we have that place now available to us in every single Catholic church. Elevating the material world and connecting the realm of everyday life to its inner spiritual essence. In fact, the deepest secret in the world is that the word table in Hebrew is shulchan, which comes from the word sholeach, to send. Hashem sends blessing to the world that resonates through all the creation, through bread on the table. This is part of what I believe the corruption of the mass, why the Novus Ordo makes so much about having a table and bread and a meal, and they're not thinking of an altar and a sacrifice and the true presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. They're taking the thoughts of Judaism. Because how many billions of um, Muslims and Chinese and Hindus are there in the world you know, maybe almost half the world's population, but they don't influence Catholic liturgy very much. We, why would we take from them? But some foolish, misled Catholic clerics, including priests, bishops, and cardinals in the 1920s and on, 
they're wide open to the teaching of Judaism, listening to these ideas. Oh, the table is special where God sends blessings to the world with bread, which sustains us. But why can't these Catholic clerics see that this the altar is infinitely better than a table? And the bread from heaven, Jesus Christ, is infinitely better than what we grow from the earth. Um, although they meet, of course, because it's bread from the earth that gets consecrated. And the life that it gives is not just to sustain us here on this planet, but it's for life everlasting. So there's a regression of these Catholic clerics with this wonderful teaching of Catholic tradition, and they're falling for Judaism, which ultimately is their aim is to draw in all mankind, but all mankind subjugated to them. And this is why the church has to get her tradition back, or we will be enslaved. I have no doubt whatsoever that we will get tradition back, because God's plans don't fail. The menorah, with its seven branches, represents the light of the divine presence, and its kindling each evening serves as a tikkun, as a fixing for the darkness that exists in this world. So you heard him say a tikkun, that they say if you light the menorah, the seven branch candlestick, that's a tikkun, it repairs the darkness in this world. It's part of this plan of tikkun olam, to repair the world, where again the Kabbalists will put the blame on God for what went wrong in the world and say they want to repair the face of God. That's not what the rabbi is saying here, um, but others. But this picture, image of the menorah which you see, it has been recast I don't know how many tons of gold that is. I think it was the year 2000, but in the about 2007, it was put on display here in the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem, overlooking the Kotel, the Western Wall. So there, it was rebuilt by the, the Temple Institute, and Rabbi Chaim Richman used to work for them. Um, they're very, very serious about rebuilding the temple and preparing all the vessels for it. Um, but of course, again, lighting a candle and think this is going to expel the darkness. No, it's a sign that the real light of the world is Jesus Christ. And he defeats the darkness because the darkness cannot comprehend him, as St. John's Prologue says at every moment. So really open up your heart deeper than ever before in your whole life. Here's the thing. As everybody knows, Israel is currently fighting a war against a cruel enemy who is committed to its total destruction. But what exactly are we fighting for? To be a nation like every other nation? For our safety and security? What is our security about and what is it dependent upon? Did you think this is just an ordinary conflict over territory, over control of land? This is not about real estate. Just get what he says is the reason for the war in Gaza at the moment that could threaten World War III. What is he telling us the reason is? Um, and he's onto something deep, though it's false. Or is it just because they hate Jews and want all Jews to die? <laughs> but why? What is Jewish identity really supposed to be all about? There's much more at stake here, what this war is really all about. And now that we have learned about the Holy Temple, we can hopefully begin to understand that the future of the whole world hangs in the balance. This is about the purpose of life. So your heart is open, right? So here's one account of many things that are happening now that many people are experiencing that are being shared on social media in Israel. I'm afraid that if Catholics don't know their tradition, they're going to be seduced and misled into this story that the temple is where the world is going to be reconciled with God and they will support that one world religion movement. But if we have our traditions, we know we have something infinitely better and we won't be tempted by this falling back. Instead, by holding our traditions, which is for our salvation, we pray properly for their conversion and when the rabbis convert, a lot of Jews will follow them. And then this tragic opposition in the world will be short-circuited, evaporated, and there'll be nowhere for Satan to play his tricks anymore. A soldier returned home from fighting in Gaza, and his mother asks him, what's the first thing that you want to do now that you're finally home? A, a shower or eat some of your favorite food? He told him, no. I want to hang a picture of the holy temple in the living room she said, what? Why? The soldier answered her, Mom, you don't understand. We saw that in Gaza, there isn't one home, one office, one classroom that doesn't have a picture of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. To the Muslims, this is a war against the Holy Temple. It's always been a war against the Holy Temple. Back in 1929, before there was a state of Israel, the Arab Well, it wasn't a war against the Holy Temple when Islam rose out of the desert in the 7th, 8th century, was it? The temple wasn't there. 
Arab Muslims in the land of Israel massacred Jews and they said that it was in the name of Al-Aqsa as they are doing so again today. And tragically, ironically, after almost 2,000 years, we have a disconnect. This disconnect is the root not only of all of Israel's suffering, but of all the world's darkness and distress. This Just the, the cause of the world's darkness and distress is not because we're disconnected with the temple and don't have the temple built. It's because people are dis disconnected with the true temple, Jesus Christ. This week, Javier Milei, the president of Argentina, a nation of almost 46 million people, visited Jerusalem. He wept openly and danced at the Western Wall. He announced that he would move his nation's embassy to Jerusalem. And I'll skip this bit, but if you're excited about the new Argentinian president, don't be. He wants to build the temple of the Holy Jerusalem, temple, which he was convinced would surely come to pass. He also said publicly what no elected Israeli polit political leader has ever said. He spoke openly and fervently of his hope that the third temple will be built as to why, in our minds, to paraphrase the prophet Haggai's complaint, the time has not yet come to build a temple. If the president of Argentina, or his prime minister, or I think his president, wants the temple rebuilt, you can see why there's going to be forever war. There are those in America as well who think they need to support Israel at all costs. Now, there's a massive gulf between those who think this is about the temple and those who think it's a political thing. Um, but the religious element is deeper and much longer in history and it will endure. It forms the political situation which, which is more superficial. But the, the religious and the prayers of people are powerful whether they are to God or to unknown gods, dark forces, to demons. They move events in the world for good if it to God or for evil if to anyone but God. Um, so why so much war? It's because of confusion about religion. If we restore the traditional liturgy, we're closer to bringing order and peace first into the church and then the world. Why do we remain so insensitive and unmoved by Hashem's point of view? Build for me a sanctuary, he says, and I will dwell among you. Does that not stir us? Isn't it time for us to realize that it's an offer that we can't afford to refuse? As we pray for the hostages, we should also remember that the Holy Temple has been taken hostage. The same captors are holding them both and holding us all hostage as the world teeters on the precipice of the abyss. The divine call that beckons us to build the Holy Temple is Hashem imploring man, hoping he'll be wanted in this world. It's the place of one love, one heart, where Hashem wants to get together and stay together with his creation. It's Interesting, he says, why don't we think of Hashem's point of view, God's point of view, that God wants to dwell with us, let's make a sanctuary for him. That does move me. I think, why don't Catholics think like this? You saw the picture of the chicken dance mass in Germany. Are any of them thinking about God? Let's build a place for God to dwell. What does God want? No, they're just thinking of themselves. But we're supposed to thinking, what, what does God want? God deserves honor and glory on earth, which the traditional mass offers to him, and which the Novus Ordo is a very pale shadow or even a mockery. So when people talk about why they like the Novus or why they like tradition, hey, wh what are you talking about? Who cares what you like? What does God like? What does God love? And he loves that his son is honored. He loves that the saints are honored and that the mother of God is honored, as they are in the traditional liturgy. And that, I think, should be our highest motivation for restoring tradition. And where Rabbi Richmond says it's, this is the place of love and one heart, again, he doesn't realize he's talking about Christ. He's talking about Holy Mass. May we build it speedily and in our day. Amen. May we restore the uh, traditional liturgy speedily and in our day. So I have one more video to go. I'll just have another quick look at the questions. Thanks for sticking with me for so long, because this is, I don't know how well it's working, just commenting over the videos. Um, yes, 
quite a few people ask me about this. They say, you know, shouldn't we be praying for Muslims and heretics? And what about praying for Catholics? Absolutely. Yes, indeed. And so we do. On Good Friday, you're praying, in fact, for every breathing soul on the face of the planet in the nine different categories. But the reason I'm focusing on the prayer for the Jews is because it's the one that's been most maligned. And if we can get that right, it means that we're absolutely fearless and we, we will get the rest right. We'll do all the other prayers because they're not so controversial as this one. Um, and if we can understand its place in the Good Friday liturgy, it's the eighth prayer of the nine great intercessions. When somebody understands that, they might understand how these intercessions are for the whole world. And if they understand that block, they'll see how that fits in with the four parts of the Good Friday liturgy, about the reading of the Passion, the great intercessions, the veneration of the cross, and the mass of the pre-sanctified. I don't know how many of you hearing me say that are familiar with that's the structure of the Good Friday liturgy. But if we would understand this one prayer, we would see where that fits in, that the whole of Good Friday is about the cross, it's about the crucifixion. And then we fit that in with the Triduum. We understand what Holy Thursday is, the institution of the priesthood and the Holy Eucharist or the Mass, so that that work of Good Friday, the Passion, can be continued to the end of time for the redemption of the world. And we'll understand what's so special about the Easter Vigil, <coughs> that time when Our Lady kept the faith, um, which is what the Church is to do. Um, even in, in a state of desolation, we, we keep the faith so that all the more we rejoice on Easter Sunday. And if one has understood then the Easter Triduum, then you understand every single Holy Mass because that's what every single Holy Mass is giving us. In fact, the Passion, Resurrection and Ascension of our Lord, as it says in the Offertory and in the Canon. So that's why I'm focusing on this prayer. It's not because I'm saying the conversion of the Jews is the most important thing in the world, but it's, it's where the fight is most intense because it's the thing the devil doesn't want at all because when it happens, it's over for him. So he's doing everything he can to keep Jews from understanding and loving Jesus Christ. And it, part of what he's doing is degrading the church, filling the hierarchy with homos so that we're not doing what we're meant to do and we're not including not praying for the conversion of the Jews. And if we don't pray for it, it won't happen. It won't happen. So that's part of Satan's plan. Um, but he's going to lose. So that's why I'm focusing on this prayer, but certainly the, the whole liturgy and the whole calendar is important. And yes, let's pray for our, our brother and sister Catholics and pray for the Orthodox that they'll come back into union with Rome and the Protestants and heretics will come back to the faith, back to the church. Pray for Muslims, Buddhists, atheists, everyone. Uh, it's, it's all done on Good Friday. Um, so I will play the next, this is the last video, um, and I think the most amiable rabbi, he's very interesting, and I'll start off on a note where a lot of us might relate to him, he's talking about the COVID times, and I respect the, the many Jews who refused to stop their services during those COVID times, and it's a disgrace that Bergoglio and bishops ordered the closure of churches. I was in, in Australia, Melbourne, had a very, very, very tough corona policy. You weren't allowed to have any minyanim at all. And when a group of people met together on Rosh Hashanah, 10 people at Rosh Hashanah, and then the police comes and everybody dispersed. <coughs> so they couldn't catch them. So I see a line there. The, the police guy says, it was in the newspaper, says, we will hunt every last person down. We will hunt them. I mean, it sounded like Nazi Germany. No, we will hunt them down, you know, for this. I myself, uh, I was conducting a Seder in Or Sameach for the boys. And we had distancing. This is the height of things. We had the social distancing and everything in the middle of the Seder. I don't know, somebody tipped the informants. The police showed up with guns and they ordered us to disperse. <laughs> All right. But be it as it may, Rav Hirsch predicted or actually suggested this would be a good thing because we would discover the holiness of the home. So the Ramban is saying, Mishkan is a prototype for the Jewish home. Just to interrupt in there, saying that, that the lockdowns were good because we discovered the holiness of the home. Many Catholics found that, rediscovering the richness of family life. Although, I must say, that's nice if you have a garden um, and a house, but if you're living in an apartment with three or more little children and you have a lockdown, it's, it's hellish. It's so inhuman to, to inflict that. Um, and in, in, in fact, there's a lot of increase in domestic abuse and child abuse during the lockdowns. 
again showing it comes from Satan. Um, but to, to answer this person, people should look up the prayer in the Missal to see what I mean about the nine prayers. Exactly, yes, because if people are asking, what's this prayer, where is it? Well, go to the Missal. And if you haven't got one, you've got to get one. And if you don't know which to get, ask people in this on this channel or on YouTube and you'll get good suggestions, like the St. Andrew's Daily Missal or the Lassance Missal. Um, they're not totally perfect, but they're, they're the best out there that, that I know of. Um, and if you end up getting the wrong one, well, it's just a step down the line in a year or two or three or four that you get a better one. But getting the missile is a massive step towards recovering and understanding our liturgy. Um, so hopefully, if, if you've no idea what we're talking about with this prayer and with the genuflection, this, this kind of like a challenge. Well, you need to make a, a big effort to, to understand what is our mass. Here, the rabbi is talking about the home and he's saying this is a kind of alternative to rebuilding the temple. If you can't rebuild the temple, you can make your heart and soul into a place for God to dwell. And we can agree with that as far as it goes spiritually, but the fullness of it is in receiving our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, making a good communion. Now to elaborate a little bit, some of Forsham and the Ramban point out an interesting parallelism. There were three fundamental miracles in the tent of Sarah. And to interrupt again, I will come now to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Do you hear him say there were three miracles in the tent of Sarah? This is the wife of Abraham, the mother of Isaac. And he, he says there are three miracles associated with her tent. And her tent is a forerunner of the tabernacle of Moses and of the temple in Jerusalem. But we know that they are forerunners of the body of Christ. So what is significant then about the tent of Sarah? And think of the Blessed Virgin Mary as the mother of Christ, the tabernacle in whom God dwelt when he took on flesh in her womb. And you'll see how these three things that the Talmud speak of and that the rabbi speaks of are fulfilled by Our Lady. Remember Rashi says that, uh, that Yitzchak brought Rivka into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and he loved her. She became his wife and he loved her. And he was comforted over the loss of Sarah, his mother. And Rashi explains because there were three miracles that were connected to the tent of Sarah. And when Sarah died, those miracles left. There was a blessing in her dough. You would eat her bread and you would feel satisfied for a very long time. Uh, she would light Nehrot, she would light lights in honor of the Shabbos. And those lights endured the entire, entire week. And there was a cloud of divine glory that hovered over her tent that represented the Shekhinah. And when Sarah Imenu died, those miracles left. And when little Rivka, maybe only three years old, some say 14 years old, comes in, all of those miracles come back. And that gave Yitzchak the comfort that the greatness that his mother brought into the world could still be replicated. So some fortune point out that you find the identical three miracles in the Mishkan itself that corresponds to the miracles of Sarah's tent. A blessing in the bread was the lechem upon him. There was a showbread. There were 12 chalos. Actually, they were matzos, like soft pita. They were not chametz like a chala. But 12 lechamim, 12 breads, were baked every Friday. And they were put on the gold shulchan on Shabbos when the old lechem would be removed. And that lechem would remain on the shulchan for the entire week till next Shabbos. And then the kohanim would eat it, and it was still warm and fresh. Okay, what does this mean about the bread being still warm and fresh after a week? The lechem is the bread, and the shulchan is the table, the golden table. Why is it still warm after a week, a miracle? Whether or not that happened, it's Talmudic rather than biblical, although the bread had to always be fresh. Um... It's, it's, I think it's pointing to the warm bloodedness of Jesus Christ. Because this bread is pointing to the bread of life, who is Jesus. And as you know, when you receive the host by concomitance, it contains also the precious blood. It's living bread, this warm blooded. So the bread was kept warm. He ties it back to Sarah's tent, saying, whenever any guest or Abraham would eat a bit of bread or dough prepared in her tent, it would sustain them for a long time. And notice he said that. When Sarah died, the three miracles ceased happening. But then when Isaac took Rivka, that's Rebecca, into the tent and was comforted for the loss of his mother when he married her, the miracle started again. So here we see a prefiguration, even in the stories of the rabbis, which are extra biblical, of an end of the old covenant, but a restarting of the miracles and graces with basically Jesus and Mary, because that story of Isaac and Rebecca, I also um, 
explain in Crucifixion to Creation is about Jesus and Mary, um, Isaac and Rebecca, even so are Abraham and Sarah, so are Jacob and Rachel. Um, but I've, I should get back to the rabbi. So that's the first miracle about the bread. And I'm sure you can make the connections with the light and the divine presence. After being on a cold shulchan for eight days, that's a bracha in the dough, obviously. And then the ner daluk, the candle that was lit, that's the ner tamid. The menorah had seven lights, but there was one light that at least when we were on a higher madrega never went out. And that's the bracha in the light. And the cloud of glory over Sarah's tent. So what's the greatest miracle? You light a candle that never goes out? Or that Jesus brings the gospel and has it spread to the ends of the world? This is the light of the world, the light of Christ that never goes out. The light of the temple has gone out definitively 2,000 years ago. You know, God's command to Aaron and his sons was, you will keep this light burning perpetually. It had to be 24 hours 7, the one light on the menorah, and the other six were lit during the day. And there were many commands of God, thought, like the twice daily offering has to be forever for eternity so those zionist jews who say that we should have israel because it should be forever that was god's promise well apart from the fact that he said if you break the covenant you lose it you'll be ejected from the land which the, which they did with the crucifixion they broke the covenant god clearly didn't mean forever just in talking about time in creation because it all stopped two thousand years ago they lost the temple and the priesthood and the eternal light and the daily sacrifices and living on the land. But does that mean that God lied or couldn't fulfill his promise or was misled? Of course not. God is true and faithful. Everything is fulfilled in Jesus Christ in Holy Mass. This is the only way it can go to the end of time. And in fact, it's for all time, for more than time, to transcend time in eternity. Lighting a candle that keeps burning I mean, it's great that we have the sanctuary lamps in the church that has a meaning, but we're supposed to understand by it, Christ is the light that cannot go out. Um, and let's pray that these Jews see that and don't fuss about rebuilding the menorah and the temple for it. Is the cloud of the Shekhinah that's over the Mishkan. So what do you see? You see a direct correspondence between the miracles of... So and that was the third miracle, the cloud... Uh, that overshadowed, that filled the tabernacle in the desert and then the temple in Jerusalem. The rabbi is saying something similar happened in the tent of Sarah and reappeared with the union of Isaac and Rivka, which is a spiritual union on Calvary of Jesus and Mary. So Mary, she was the one who contained as a tent, as a tabernacle for Jesus to dwell in first, that bread of life, the light of the gospel that's never going to go out, and the presence of God, the Holy Ghost overshadowed her, using the same word in the Greek as the overshadowing of the temple by the Shekinah, the presence of God. Clearly, all these things, tabernacle and temple, are pointing to Mary and then the body of Christ as the true temple, but also Sarah's tent, uh, which the rabbis have so many beautiful things to say about it. Wonderful will be the day when they start applying that to Our Lady and even... I think, surprising us Catholics with the, the richness of what's there in the scriptures. And the miracles of the Mishkan, as if to say, the Mishkan is a replication, an imitation of what a Jewish home could potentially be. And therefore the real Mishkan of Hashem is the Jewish home. Indeed, Chazal say, Ish isha, when a man and a woman live with Shalom Bayis, Shechina, Shereya the divine presence is with them. They become the Mishkan. Hashem says, make for me a sanctuary, so I will dwell in them. So it does not say, make for me a mishkan, so I will dwell in it. Make for me a mishkan, so I will dwell in them. It's in your heart and in your soul. You build a mishkan for Hashem. It's a very powerful idea. The mishkan is just a physical reminder, based on mikdash, later, that we have to create a mishkan for God in our hearts. In fact, there's a famous, uh, <laughs> I shouldn't use this as a makar, there is a famous Shaker him that says, No, Lord, help me make a sanctuary in my heart that is much based on this teaching. So, as Christians, we're familiar with the idea of making a home for God in our heart. Do you hear him refer to a shaker him there? Lord, build for me a sanctuary in my heart. But the shakers have been corrupted away from Christianity by Judaism, by listening to the Jews and being seduced and overwhelmed by that and thinking this is the direction they're going to go to it. 
the Shakers, I think, would definitely be influenced by the Sabbateans and this kind of enthusiasm that is not of the Holy Ghost. It's from below. Um, so we, we, by raising our game spiritually, we'll, we can help raise theirs and see that there's this bridge where it's realizing God wants to dwell in our hearts, but he does it through the incarnation, first of all, dwelling in the flesh, in the Virgin Mary, and then dwelling amongst us till he was crucified, resurrected, and now dwells amongst us in the sanctuaries of Catholic churches, which are so many bishops and cardinals are having desecrated and don't or don't have the backbone to stand up to the people who are doing it. You know, one of the minor, the first of the minor orders is porters. The job of which Paul VI tried to abolish this in 1974, the minor orders. The porter's job is to keep order in the church by keeping people out the church that shouldn't be there. So when you abolish the order of porters, of course you have abominations like in St. Patrick's Cathedral with the trans service. Um, and and you'd, if we had porters, proper porters who love Christ in that church in Germany when you had a clown dancing in the sanctuary to the chicken song, they would drag him out, throw him out, or, or her, I don't know what it was, then be more gentle if it was a woman, but definitely get them out the sanctuary and out the church. It's an important idea. You know, all of us pray for the base of Mikdash. And all of us want to build the base of Mikdash. But people make a mistake when you think, I build the base of Mikdash by bombing the mosques and starting construction. That's not the time. And I'll talk about that for a few moments as well. You build a base of Mikdash when you make a dwelling place for Hashem in your heart and in your soul. And that is why the... And God bless the rabbi here for, for saying that the way to build the house of God is you're not going to do it by bombing the mosques. I'm starting war with the Muslims. That How is that going to serve God's purpose? He has this deep understanding that that won't work. There needs to be a spiritual solution. Please, God, pray he takes those extra steps of conversion. The miracles of the Mikdash correspond to the three miracles of the tent of Sore Imenu. That is the prototype. That is the highest level of a Jewish home. This is what a Jewish home is. So why don't we build a base on Mikdash? How do we get out of it? So some people answer, just kind of a, you know, a way out, that under modern economic, social, and military conditions. Building, trying to build a base of Mikdash would almost inevitably trigger war, and maybe nuclear war. So as a result, pikuach nevesh patrasat, meaning the same way you don't have to keep Shabbos as a matter of life and death, you don't have to build a Mikdash if it's pikuach nevesh. So we would look at it as pikuach nevesh. So some say, yeah, you are high to build a base of Mikdash, but you have a heter not to because of pikuach nevesh. Some maintain that that demonstrates a lack of faith. I mean, don't you assume that God is going to give you that? Well, but the answer is this, though. Keep in mind, that even when Shlomo HaMelech built the base of Mikdash, he was authorized to do so only after he achieved peace. Remember, David HaMelech did not. Which means it is part of the mitzvah of Binyan Beis HaMikdash that there has to be Shalom al Yisrael. That Shlomo is Solomon who built the house of God because David, though very holy, he was a man of war, a man of blood. So God said, you can't build it, but your son will build it. And Jesus Christ, of course, is the true king of peace who is not a man of shedding blood but the man of pouring out his own blood and therefore he is the one who builds the true temple but again it's good that this rabbi finds sense in saying that um if you think that you are fulfilling god's will has got to be by causing world war three then you're on the wrong track pause rethink so this idea that you don't build in a time when it would trigger arms conflict is built into the very structure of when the mitzvah was given so that's one answer the Rambam himself suggests an interesting answer, and it's hard to know what his makar is. That the mitzvah to build a base of Mikdash depends on Mashiach. And maybe it's connected to peace, maybe not. That until Mashiach comes, it is the role of Mashiach to be bona, the base of Mikdash. And therefore, until Bias HaMashiach, we prepare ourselves spiritually, making a place for God in our hearts. But the actual mitzvah of Binyan HaMikdash Papayo is a messianic mitzvah. That says the opposite of the Rambam. The Rambam says, first Mashiach comes, and then we build a Mikdash. Says the Talmud Yerushalmi, no. First you build the base of Mikdash, and that brings Mashiach. First you build it. What's the expression about the baseball stadium? For? This is part of the problem. Some people think you have to build the temple to bring the Messiah to come. And there's a lot of Christian Zionists who believe this falsehood as well. Um, as if it lies in the hands of man to push this through, no matter what destruction and conflict it causes, and that somehow that's going to bring about salvation. But good cannot come out of evil. Um, and the converse of that is it St. Peter or St. Paul, St. Paul who says that charity can do no harm. You know, charity can't be, an act of charity can't be against the law. Um, 
that should be our governing principle. Build it and they'll come or something. So it says, you know, Field of Dreams. Field of Dreams, right? So it says, build it, build it, and he'll come. The will come when you show that you care enough. So according to the Yushami, so, so the people in the Temple Mount or the people maybe more radical who are talking about building the base of Mikdash uh, before Mashiach, they have a Makor for what they're saying based on the Yushami. So it's not totally uh, crazy. But as they say, the Rambam himself does not pass in that way. And Obviously, if the second base of Mikdash was destroyed because of Sinas Chinam, the hatred and polarization among Jews, it's not going to get rebuilt until we can eradicate that's Sinat Chinam. And unfortunately, we're not... He said the second temple was destroyed because of hatred among Jews. That means that in 70 AD, the Romans came and destroyed the temple. Interesting, he thinks the reason is hatred among Jews. It should be clear that it's that hatred that some of the Jews had for Jesus Christ, another Jew, and then hatred they had for the apostles, who the first, uh, all the apostles were Jews, um, and the persecuting them dragging them out of synagogues, having them stoned or executed. And it's because of that, because they didn't receive the gospel that the Messiah brought, that God had the temple destroyed. That's the hatred among Jews um, that he doesn't realize he's talking about. There yet, although Ruch Hashem things have gotten a little better precisely because of the war, although now they're getting a little schwach again, and we have to be very, very vigilant that the Beis HaMikdash is not about a building, it is about a relationship. And that relationship requires that we make our heart and our soul a repository for the Shekhinah. Mishkan is a response to Chedo Ega. The Soprano says that the Mishkan... Uh, he's talking about the golden calf here. That there's a theory that the idea of building the tabernacle and the temple is God's way of rescuing us from the golden calf. Or you can think of the sin of Adam's fall. The reason I've included this is just think of us on the Easter Vigil singing about the Felix Culpa, the happy fault of Adam, that theologians debated, would God have become man? Would Jesus have taken on flesh if Adam hadn't sinned? It's not totally clear. Um, I, th I think it's, St. Thomas says that the, he, he came to redeem us, and if we hadn't sinned, then there would be no need to redeem us. So it is very much Adam's sin which in a way provoked the incarnation, even though God saw it long in advance before he began creation, he knew he would do this thing. But there's a parallel with what the rabbi is saying here, talking about the temple being a kind of a compensation or result of the golden calf. It's actually, although it creates a spiritual closeness, it actually shows a certain weakness because in an ideal world, God would be accessible everywhere. And my apologies to the rabbi. I had him on one and a half speed up till now. I didn't realize. Um, but out of respect, I put him down now to, well, when I recorded this video, down to normal speed. House would be a Mishkan. Every home would be a Mishkan. You wouldn't need a special place to serve God. You wouldn't need special people. You wouldn't need special rituals. Every meal would be a korban. The, the Egel created a distancing. The Egel created a merchat. So yes, Hashem and his Rachmim still gave us a way to connect. But a specific place, specific times, specific rituals, specific ways. All right, I'll t although it's awesome what he's saying now about the... Actually, we need specific time and place and architecture. The rabbi is about to say, God doesn't need it, but we need it. Well, that's what we have in the traditional mass. And if we throw that out, we'll see how everything else falls apart. But thanks be to God, I'm sure we'll restore it. Meanwhile, there's this question. I think someone commented that Zionism equals Satanism. I ignored that because it's false. It's not true. Zionism is a political movement, right? And it has some proponents and members who are Satanists. Satanists is broader and deeper than Zionism. In fact, there's that... that um, I'll deal with it in the future, this idea that Zionism is just part of a bigger plan, much darker, that they realize Zionism is going to fail, it's going to come to an end, but that's part of the world domination plan. You can't equate Zionism with Satanism, though I think both are wrong. And Pope Pius X said that the church cannot support Zionism. It cannot. That land is sanctified by Jesus Christ. We can't support a political establishment there that rejects him. However, if the Jews return, the church is not going to stop them. She, she doesn't have that kind of, she doesn't want to use physical force, um, but she'll be ready there to baptize them and convert them and bring them, welcome them into the church. 
But Pius the, Pope Pius X, Saint Pope Pius X, absolutely clear, the church cannot support Zionism. And that should never have changed. There's nothing has happened since that. He said that to Theodore Herzl um, on the feast of the conversion of Saint Paul back in, I can't remember what year, maybe 1907. Um, nothing's changed since then to change that because you can't change theological and spiritual truth through even whatever tragedies have happened since. Um, that's the church's position on Zionism. But Zionism is not, is not Satanism. Uh, but let's listen to what the rabbi is saying about the specificity, specificity of a time and a place and an architecture which God doesn't need, but it's for God's glory and honor, and therefore we need it, because the glory of God is the life of man. So the idea of a mishkan is a monument to a spiritual failure in which the ego created a distance, the ego created a merchak, and had there not been a chayda ego, we wouldn't have needed that spiritual way station. That's what the Soporno says. And that could be the meaning of Rashi. Why would we have a Beis Hamik? So that was the bit saying if there hadn't been a sin, there wouldn't need the, the restoration. Or if, if Adam hadn't sinned, we wouldn't have needed Christ. So if there hadn't been the golden calf, then there would have been no need to build the temple. Dash when Mashiach comes. I mean, one would assume that as the, as the world is getting to a higher and higher and higher perfected level, the whole world should be the base of Mikdash. Do not portray God in any physical way. Yeah, I, I, sorry for interrupting you, Rabbi, again, but Lloyd, I, I agree. This channel and this theme on the videos is not supposed to be a place for bashing the Jews. Obviously, I disagree with Judaism and I'm opposed to Zionism. And I, I think the biggest gulf in the world is between those who accept the new covenant and those who reject the new for the sake of the old. We, we have this massive difference in problems. Um, and there is Satanism involved, but it, this discussion is very much aimed at restoring our liturgy for the glory of God, for our salvation, and eventually in God's time for their conversion. And in the meantime, for anyone else who God will bring to him in heaven. It's not a place just for bashing the Jews um, especially with, with, with falsehood, we, we have to be careful that we're accurate with what we say. And if I make mistakes, I'll be grateful to be corrected. The Torah itself says, remember, you saw no picture, you saw no image. Right? In fact, there are even halachos about having images of the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets, lest you look at them as objects of worship. And yet... If you walked into the Kodesh HaKadosh, the Aron HaKodesh, the holiest place in the world, you're going to see these two cherubs, these two kruvim, over the Aron. Look like little children. We have idol we have statues, so to speak. He's talking about the two cherubs over the Ark of the Covenant, saying how is it that if Jews were forbidden from making images to avoid idolatry, that they have these cherubs in the holy place? Um, and... He'll, he'll, he'll come soon to talk about Christianity, how God's trying to make a concession for our need to see something visible. But how wonderful if he would see, well, no, God's actually completely fulfilled that need by giving us uh, our Lord so close to us to see and hear and touch him and now to, to receive him in the Holy Eucharist. In the Kodesh Akdashim. Now, during the second temple, we didn't. There was no Aron HaKodesh. So if you walked into the Kodesh HaKodeshim, it was an empty room. But in the Mishkan and in the bias of Shlomo HaMelech, you have the Kruvin. That's because after the temple was destroyed in the Babylonian captivity, the uh, Ark of the Covenant was lost. And so when they rebuilt the temple for the 500 years before Jesus, the Holy of Holies was empty. There was no Ark in there. So when the Emperor Titus and his, Titus, his soldiers got in there, and saw that they'd been having this most ferocious battle to, to get the Temple Mount, and they got into the Holy of Holies and saw nothing was there. He was furious, because he said, how is it you people have fought like no other people I've ever fought in all my campaigns to defend an empty space? Uh, part of the mystery of religion. That's, that's why I respect that rabbi we heard before. In fact, it's this one saying that during the lockdowns, they didn't stop. They didn't stop their services because um, nothing is as important as God and our connection with him. Um, 
but please God, we have to understand how that connection is, is reached. I think I'm making too many interruptions, so I'll let this run. There's another three minutes, but he makes some very good points that, I mean, interesting for Christians. What's going on? Shavuda Halevi develops the idea that when people have a certain human need to connect to God a certain way, and they're not able to connect to Hashem except through that vehicle, Hashem will give them in some kosher way the vehicle that they need to have that connection. Ravita Levi says, visualization is a natural need of a human being. It's very difficult for me to relate to something or someone that I can't see in any way. Um, I think I've just made the same mistake of not having the microphone on when trying to comment. So I don't know if, how much I've, you've missed of the previous comments. Hopefully it's just the idea that this visible thing that he's saying, you know, men need to see something visible in order to relate. God's fulfill that with the incarnation and then with the signs that we have of the sacraments of our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. God has actually fulfilled it. It's not just fulfilled in the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant that was lost 500 years before Christ to have an empty, empty holy place. Uh, God knows our needs and he's proportioned all the means of salvation to us. Now the problem is, once I engage in visualization, I could be steered into idolatry, into paganism, into various other depravities. So Hashem kind of makes boundaries that I will give you this concession, but it has to be in this time and in this place. The Mishkan is a, the whole Mishkan, not just the Kodesh HaKadoshim, is a very visual way of serving God. We serve God by altars. We serve God by sacrifices. We serve God by architecture. Yeah, but they don't serve God by altars and sacrifices because the temple was destroyed 2,000 years ago. Um, rather, the Catholic Church has the greatest architecture that anyone in the world has ever seen in her cathedrals. And we do have the altar and we do have the sacrifice. Now, God doesn't need the architecture and God doesn't need the sacrifices. But we need it. And therefore, Hashem is giving us a concrete, visual, and physical way of relating to Him. And this is because why is the Novus Ordo being created? And why are the churches suffering so much sacrilege, like in the Stefan Storm and St. Patrick's and that German church earlier on? Um, it should be understood that, that the visual is vital for our religion and the physical, as we're spiritual and material beings, body and soul. Had there not been a Cheda Ego, you wouldn't have needed that visual me medium of connecting to God. Hashem gives you a physical, tangible, visual way of relating to Him. I remember hearing from my own Rosh Hashiva, Rav Yaakov Weinberg, Zichron Levracha, that the great attraction of Christianity was it gave you a very intimate way of connecting to God because God is so close to you that he became human and died for your sins. Now, granted, that's Sheker V'chazav. It's just not true. But it's... Well, it is, it's absolutely true. This is why we pray for their conversion. Uh, they can see how good is this teaching in the church, how good for people. Why do they reject it? As if... What, one way of understanding what's true about Catholic theology or about reality. Just think, what is the most perfect? That's what God does. Uh, anything that better than which nothing more perfect can be conceived, that's what actually God does. Um, that's his nature. He can't. An enormously appealing idea. In other words, the, the way religion gets people sometimes is by offering ideas that can be very, very comforting, even though they happen not to be emis. Uh, but that's why one of the reasons why Christianity had such an explosive growth because it does create that type of notion of an intimate connection to God. Uh, for us to have that intimacy is a little more difficult to fully comprehend. And the Kuzari says the Mishkan or the Mikdash was one of those ways that we could feel that connection. So for example, if you have uh, a very, very wealthy person who gives a hundred dollars, 
hundred dollars is, is a you know nice donation to somebody. And this is the last point from one of Rabbi. Um, he's talking about the poor person's donation being worth much more than a wealthy person's donation. There's two reflections here. One, think of Jesus teaching about the widow's might, who's given this teaching. Um, I hope the rabbi realizes who gave the teaching best. And then think of the exchange between us and God. God being the wealthy person, what does he give? And us being the poor person, what can we give? Just half a minute. And then you have a poor person who gives a dollar. It could very well be that a Kaddish Baruch will be machshiv of the dollar of the poor person, much more than the hundred dollars of the Gevir, because the hundred dollars of the Gevir does not involve any sacrifice at all. If he gives a million dollars, that's a different story. A hundred dollars, right? Not, 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 not such a big deal. And this is the statement of the Chachamim, of Chazal, according to the suffering is the reward. So you heard that last line, according to the suffering is the reward. If only you would see that there was no greater suffering than Jesus on the cross. And therefore there is no greater reward than for him. And he, he's rewarded with all those souls he brings to God for eternity. Um, if the millionaire giving a hundred dollars or, or, or the rich man giving a hundred dollars or a million dollars. Now think of God as the rich man. Uh, the Gavir, the mighty man. And what did he give? He gave his son. He gave his life. He gave everything. And we're the poor man who, who might give a dollar. And does that dollar match God's million dollars? Of course not in absolute terms. But again, St. Thomas Aquinas talks about a proportion of what we can offer to God. And what's suitable and perfect is when we give him everything we can. Because we can't give more than that. So in a certain way it's perfect. And if we would give our life for God, and if not in martyrdom, then at least daily in our duties of state. And that's the answer, by the way, to all this end of the world stuff and people have theories about aliens or the Nephilim or uh, the deep state. A lot of it's true, a lot of it's garbage and it's impossible to find out. But if we will keep our duties of state, if we will get to mass every Sunday, pray the rosary every day, do the five first Saturdays, which brings us into touch with the sacraments and prayer like nothing else can. This is where we get our salvation and those of, that, of those we love where we do the best for their salvation and for people we've never met before. Um, so the, the little idea then about the poor man and the rich man, I think it meets where God gives his life for us and we give ourselves to him increasingly every day. Um, to go back to this scheme now on the left of the screen with looking back, six or seven thousand years I'll, I'll wrap up this live stream because it's been about two hours now um the temple in fact rebuilding the temple is not the deepest current in history i mean it was built three thousand years ago predated by the tabernacle by another 400 years or so and by sarah's tent by another 400 years or so so we're talking about three thousand eight hundred years or four thousand years we've had these prefigurations of the body of Christ up until his coming, then they're all lost and destroyed, and we have the body of Christ in the Holy Eucharist and Holy Mass every day ever since. Um, but going back further than all that, even earlier than the Babylon exile, when the Jews were picking up these Babylonian cults, earlier than the exodus from Egypt, where um, we saw that verse from Exodus 12, 28, where the, or 38, the mixed multitude of many nations carried out the secrets of sorcery of the black magic from Pharaoh's court. And, and that would infect Judaism and, and the Hebrews and the world ever since. Um, and, and they picked it up pretty quick, by the way. There were those in the desert rebelling against Moses. Babylon was so full of cultic black magic. We, the first time we read about it in the Bible is when that city of Babel was established, I think, by Nimrod, who's a figure for the Antichrist. And then the Tower of Babel, which is about one world government, about rejecting God's plan, trying to reach up to the heavens by our own strength. Um, which is this idea now people think that they can get attain to eternal life, to immortality. And they do all sorts of sick experiments on embryos to try and achieve that um, or else just that the idea that we can build heaven on earth a utopia communism anything but the truth of catholicism 
goes back to Babel. And then going back at earlier still, it's all from Satan in that rejection of God, that lie of the servant. And we know from Genesis 3.15, God's promises that um, the, the woman will crush the serpent's head or the seed will crush the serpent's head. In fact, it's both acting in concert, Jesus in Mary and Mary acting through Jesus. Um, will destroy Satan. And I think the one takeaway I hope that we, we can pray that the Jews might see is like that Sarah's tent and those blessings in Sarah's tent are fulfilled by Mary. The bread that satisfies is Jesus Christ, the bread of life. The light that never goes out is the gospel that he preached and lived and died and rose again. That's the gospel. It's what he does more than what he says. And then the presence of God coming down and dwelling um, over the tabernacle, over Mary in her immaculate conception and then in the, at the Annunciation. Um, and then she just grows from grace to grace all the days of her life. And you remember at the Exodus that Moses' sister Miriam, which is Mary, she danced after with a timbrel and sang the song about the victory over Pharaoh, saying, horse and rider have been thrown into the sea and sung like lead into the sea. Even there, she's a prefiguration of Our Lady, singing about the victory over the evil one. And this is, which Mary did in her Magnificat, uh, that the mighty are cast down from their thrones and that the hungry are filled with good things. Those who hunger and thirst for justice and for truth will be filled with the goods of the Holy Eucharist. Um, so Our, Our Lady fulfills all these stories in the Old Testament going right back to the beginning. And that, that's why we shouldn't worry too much about war, about Zionism, about the attempts to rebuild the temple, about the occult, about black magic, about the Masons. Um, bad as all those things are, even we're not worried about Satan, the serpent, we're not worried. He's, he's bound to have his head crushed, that's it. Um, and our, our Lady will have the, the, the glory of achieving that. Uh, in fact, she already did it on Calvary, and it will be fulfilled as that was a type at, at the, in the last generation. So I'm just scanning down the last of the comments, and then I will wrap up the live stream. Thank you all very much for joining. Um, sorry for my errors with the muting the microphone for parts of those, and that the volume was low on the video, so I'll try and improve on that. I'll try and do shorter live streams. Um, are there any urgent comments there if not i will oh just a very i see a few people talking about the noahide laws um yeah the noahide laws have nothing to do with them they're bunk they're bad they're real distraction they're massive falling away from the new covenant the new and eternal covenant of christ never mind reverting back to the mosaic covenant or with abraham or whatever they want to go back to noah that makes no sense at all noah Great man, great and holy saint, no doubt about it. But a man of his time, we, we're not. And the Noahide laws I don't have much to do with Noah anyway. It's just a one world control mechanism to float. Um, so, first five Saturdays, that's what's going to uh, help us more than anything apart from the traditional liturgy, the pre-55 triduum, and from there, hopefully, pre-55 all year round, the Missal of St. Of Pope Pius V. Okay, God bless you all. I will sign off as soon as I can find the finish button. I think that's it.